Hi, and welcome to Northwest Brew Talk. I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is episode number 11. On today's show, we will have an interview with English Setter Brewing, our brew news and views, and local music from the Low Hums. If you have any comments or questions, you can send us an email at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at nwbrewtalk, and we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. To start the show, let's open a beer. All righty. This is Epiphany Pale Draft L from Old Schoolhouse Brewing. I don't know how much ABV is because it's not on the bottle here. Owners Casey and Laura Rudd and their seven children opened Old Schoolhouse Brewery in 2008. They are located in Winthrop and have made this brewery into a family-friendly community gathering spot. They feature local food and award-winning beers. Yes, they do. Winthrop, the pass is open, so you can get there from the uh, western Washington now. So Old School House describes their Epiphany Pale as a medium-bodied pale ale with moderate bitterness, slight caramel malt flavor, and a modest citrusy hop aroma. You should like that. It won the best of the Northwest Pacific region at the U.S. Beer Tasting Championships in 2014. Yep. Don't... Actually, it doesn't have much of a smell. I was kind of surprised. But um, pretty golden in color. Had a decent head on it at the beginning. And it, it does have moderate bit, uh, bitterness, and uh, uh, you can definitely taste some hops. It's pretty good. Ah, yes, it is. And now on to our brew news and views. <laughs> Nearly every week, we hear of a brewery celebrating an anniversary or a brewery expanding. Seems like there is not yet a saturation point for the number of breweries in Washington. There are several new items related to that. Birchman's Brewing Company in Yakima is a nano brewery that, has, that began production in October of 2014. Run by Lori and Doug Robinson, Birchman's became fully operational in January. They built a brew house on their residential property and self-distribute their beer, currently kegging in IPA, pale ale, and coffee stout. The Robinsons want to craft brews that showcase the Yakima Valley. They will be our guest on a future show, so make sure you tune in. Also, Sea Pine Brewing in Seattle signed a lease on Utah Avenue in Soto for a brewing expansion. They're going to be building through the spring and summer, so congratulations to them. There were several stories out about Molson Coors CEO Mark Hunter, who made some interesting comments during a call with investment analysts. It seems that he is well aware of the gains craft beer has made in recent years. According to the Denver Post, CEO Hunter said that Molson Coors has a strong interest in, quote, craft acquisitions, unquote, obviously following its larger competitor Anheuser-Busch. For the first time, craft brewery sales broke into double digits across the country, rising in volume from 7.8% of all beer sold in 2013 to 11% in 2014. In dollars, that was $19.6 billion, a 22% growth over 2013. Over 22 million barrels of craft beer were produced in 2014, and with the changes to how the Brewers Association defines craft beer, Yingling of Pennsylvania is now the number one producer, followed by Boston Beer uh, with their Sam Adams brand. De Schutz of Bend, Oregon, is number seven. With Elysian being removed from the craft category, no Washington craft breweries made the top 50. April 17th and 18th is the Leavenworth Ale Festival. You can check out LeavenworthAleFest.com for all the details. Expect beer, live music, and more. And coming up later this month, Saturday, April 25th to be exact, the Seattle Beer Festival Fundraiser, the Spokane Cork, Keg and Spirits Festival, and in Bellingham it is April Brews Day. That day is also Spinnaker Bay's anniversary party. So across the state, April 25th is a busy beer day. Bale Breaker Brewery of Moxie, Washington, was recently recognized by Men's Journal for their Top Cutter IPA, which they ranked on, ranked on the sixth best be- tasting beer in the country, from a sample of 101 beers from across the country. Fremont Brewing of Seattle also made the cut at number five for the Corwichi Canyon Organic Fresh Hop Ale. 
The hops are delivered within 24 hours of harvesting to create this annual beer. Congratulate, congratulations to both breweries for their fine beers. I'd like you to say that Corwichi whole thing again three times fast. I don't think you can, can you? No, I don't think so. All right, we have some local beer news courtesy of Washington Beer Blog. No Lie Brewhouse in Spokane announced No Boundary on the River 3.0, their third small batch beer festival on Saturday, May 16th. They will feature 12 rare barrel-aged experimental and infused beers. The cost, uh, the event cost $20, and it's the first two have both sold out, so make sure you get your tickets now. Wander Brewing in Bellingham released their first beer from their Wander Barrel Project on April 2nd. The Wild Warehouse Barrel-Aged Farmhouse. Uh, if it's available in 750 milliliter bottles, the beer was aged in barrels from a Chatter Creek winery in Woodenville and aged nine months. And lastly, Seattle Mariners kicked off their season on Monday and Safe Cofield in Seattle is featuring a lot of local beer. They have cast conditioned beers. Fridays are Firkin Friday. Ten breweries are participating in the cask rotation and 23 breweries, including several Oregon ones, are available at different locations throughout the ballpark. So while the pitcher is warming up, you can get one of the Northwest's fine beers. And that is the Brew News and Views this week. Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you have not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and other sites. And if you like us, a review and rating would be really appreciated. But even more important, tell your friends about NW Brew Talk via social media or whatever way you want. All right, now let's talk to Jeff Bendio of English Center Brewing in Spokane Valley. Okay, we are here with Jeff Bendio from English Center Brewing in Spokane Valley. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, you are one of the owners of English Center, right? Correct. My wife and I. Okay. So um, why don't you give us a, a little background on how the brewery got started? Well, we actually started out doing wine years ago just for ourselves and actually realized we like beer better than wine, so we switched over to, like everybody else, home brewing, and uh, everybody seemed to really like the beers, so they wanted to have us do weddings and birthday parties and things like that, so we figured, gosh, we better get licensed, so we went ahead and applied for our brewery's license, and that was actually the first year you could do it out of your garage in Washington State. So we started that, and people started showing up. Pretty soon they were dragging chairs over into the driveway, and it was getting out of control. So we decided to move down to our current location, and we've been here just over a year now. Awesome. So uh, English Setter, is that somebody's dog? Uh, I actually have English Setters and run them in uh, National Shoot to Retrieve trials and then hunt with them in the fall. Oh, great. So made a uh, normal uh, transition there to name the brewery that then, huh? Absolutely. They're they're the kids these days. Yeah, exactly. So let's see. Um, now, what year did you open? Uh, we opened in this current location November, I mean, February 1st of last year. So okay. we just passed our one-year anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. So let's see. Uh, about how long uh, had you been homebrewing before that? Uh, a couple of years before that, and then we had been doing wine about five years before that. So we've been in the brewing industry, if you will, for you know eight, nine years probably total. Okay. So what size system are you running? Uh, we're running a three-barrel here. We're not distributing it all around Spokane. Uh, we're pretty much selling everything right over the front counter, and uh, we're doing everything we can just to keep up with that. Okay, well, that's great. Um, and I noticed that you do like, uh, you seem to like a lot of porters and IPAs. Do you lean towards those? Uh, well, we run up and down the, the tap handles depending on the season. Uh, right now we're moving back up. We've got uh, pale, two blondes an amber, a red, a brown, uh, porter, and three, four IPAs up. Okay. 
And in the winter, we tend to get some stouts and stuff in. And then in the summer, we're moving back up. We've got a red IPA and an orange grapefruit pale coming out. So we're going to move back toward the lighter beers for spring and summer. Sure. Sounds good. Um, So what type of funding did you guys uh, use when you started up the brewery? Uh, We self-financed it. Oh, okay. My wife and I still have our day jobs. So So this is really more a... I guess a hobby out of control. Uh, so we fitted in around the two day jobs and, and we got some great staff here to help us out. And so, uh, you know, it just works. Okay. Now, uh, do you know how many barrels you did last year? Uh, Ooh, gosh, I'd have to count. And let's see. We probably do three, three, six, so 12, probably 100. Okay, All right, great. So uh, what was the first beer that you brewed? Uh, it was our, and still is, our Chucker Nose Amber. Nice. And uh, has the recipe changed at all? Nope. No, once we got it dialed in the way we wanted it, uh, I don't think any of our patrons would let us change it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> So do you, do you, um, uh, is, so that's your, is that your, your biggest seller or? No, surprisingly we sell, we have nine taps and we sell or go through, uh, right now 17 different styles of beer and the variation between the best selling and the slowest beer is probably about 4%. Mm, okay. So we don't really have a flagship beer. They all kind of go at the same rate, which is which is a good thing, but at the same time, it makes a brewing schedule kind of a mess. Right, right. So um, is, is, is this you just wanting to com- keep trying different styles? Is that why you have so many different beers? Uh, well, we've got – everybody always, of course, wants – to know what's new on tap. Okay. Um, but uh, a lot of what we've done is we've looked at our taps, and for instance, we have two blondes, you know, a couple of different IPAs, two or three different porters, and so uh, a couple of pails. And so as one tail goes out, we replace it with a different pail, but we keep the same style. So okay. when you walk in, we pretty much have a, a gamut of beers across the taps again, shifting for season, but there's always a different blonde up or a different pale up or a different porter up or something like that. So people can come in and, and try something new and then, you know, still have their favorites when they circle back around. Okay. That's interesting. So you still keep, uh, keep those same styles, but you just change it up a little bit. So they do have something different. Yeah. And a lot of them are really sad when, you know, for instance, their, their Amber goes down uh, but they know it'll be back up uh, when the, you know, the current flavor has gone. So they're pretty happy with that. And then when the amber comes back around, they're happy and they're, you know, they celebrate and start drinking the amber again. And, and uh, a lot of them will switch to the red when the amber has gone or down to the brown. And, and uh, then when the other amber comes out, they're happy with that. So, yeah, they're uh, they love the styles and the variation of the styles of crop, but uh, pretty much most of the people here, they'll try one of the new ones. Uh, we have a couple of seasonal beers and stuff, but then they always go back to their their most favorites. Okay, nice. So uh, are there any styles that you haven't done yet that you want to pursue? Uh, we have two that we didn't get to this year. I had a new stout that I wanted to try and I just didn't have the time to get to it. And now with the spring, summer weather coming, we don't typically carry a stout because it doesn't, you know, not a lot of people drink stouts when it's 90 degrees outside. Yeah. And the other one, uh, a friend of mine that's a home brewer back in the Midwest, uh, had given me a recipe that he really liked of a, a Guinness style that he had been playing with and wanted me to play with it. So I haven't brewed it yet, but uh, I want to take a look at doing a Guinness for the winter as well. And then we do have in the spring our first round of our orange grapefruit pale that's coming out that we've 
we brewed once before just in a small test batch and we're pretty happy with it, but we're going to make a few changes to it and, and, uh, bring that one out. Nice. It sounds, uh, sounds pretty refreshing. Yeah. And then we play with the seasonals. We didn't want to do a pumpkin beer this fall. So we did an actual apple back beer. Uh, we're up by green bluff. So there's a lot of, uh, apple harvest up there. So it wasn't a really sweet apple pie ish kind of beer. It really was a nice ale that instead of having a citrus back from the hops, really more pulled kind of a tart Granny Smith apple flavor out of it. And then for Christmas, we did an orange chocolate porter, which turned out amazingly well. It went really fast. Wow, nice. Now, do you, now you mentioned the, the, the apples. Do you try to source locally? Yes. Yeah, everything right here we get from the Northwest. Okay, nice. Um, are there In fact, any? I got a guy bringing hops up today. Oh, there you go. Are there any um, uh, any specific hops or yeast that you're partial to when you brew? Uh, I'd say the workhorse is the USO five. That it just it's a nice stable yeast, and and uh, we use a couple of various varieties. But I'd say that US is probably the workhorse for us here. And the hops, we're partial to the seas. And, uh, you know, the Columbus Cascade, Centennial Chinook. Uh, we have a couple of nobles. I like some of the German nobles, the uh, Tetanang and the Howard Tau Hirschbacher styles. Um, so uh, we try and do a nice cross variety of, of hops. We do have some single hop beers as well as some uh, five hop. So we kind of spread the hop flavors all over the place. Okay, so um, to go along with that, lost that question that was in my head. Um, uh, okay, um, you have a you have a brew pub, you have a menu, right? Correct, we do. Uh, all the food here is done in hot air cookers, so nothing deep fried or grilled. But it's a good pub cross section. We've got a couple of different pizzas, hamburgers, fries, tots, onion rings, chicken sandwiches. Uh, we do a salad. So it's pretty basic pub food, but uh, uh, we have a large tap room. We actually see 75 in the tap room and another 30 in the outdoor seating. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, we uh, we wanted to provide food for a lot of the people. They tend to hang around, and especially on Saturday nights, we have live acoustic music. So they usually come in, have a pizza, a couple of beers, listen to the music, and they're pretty happy. Nice. So uh, how does that uh, greasely fryer work? Uh, it's basically an industrial, commercial, hot air conduction oven. Oh. We actually have two of them. We had to buy a second one because we were going through so much food. Mm. Oh. And so everything comes out. You know, the onion rings come out crispy on the outside, but when you bite into them, all you get is hot onion. You don't get that big splash of grease or anything. Oh, nice. Now, um, you do you do some distribution or very little? Very, very little. Um, like I say, we just sold two kegs to a uh, investment firm that was having a private party down for the NCAA tournament uh, today. Um, there's a couple of places. Uh, there's a lot of places that would like to put our beer on, but with a three-barrel system and with as much as we push through the front counter, it's pretty hard for us to be able to do any kind of distribution. Maybe on a limited basis we might do some, but... Uh, you know, on a Friday or a Saturday night, we can run 300 people through here. Mm, it's it's uh, yeah. it can go through a lot of beer. Yeah, that's quite a few people. Um, so, yeah. so does uh, does the future hold a larger brewing system for you? Uh, actually, I think what I'd probably do is just pick up more fermenters. We have five right now. I would probably increase it to nine, and then we could, you know, not only. Uh, stack some batches into more fermenters, but it would give us the opportunity to do some different varieties. If I had one fermenter per tap, it would make my life a lot easier because oh. right now we're, because all the beer goes down at the same rate, it's kind of like, you know, spinning plates in the circus. Oh, yeah. They all start wobbling and you got to run back and forth <laughs> to see which one's going to fall first. Right. <laughs> I had nine fermenters, one for each tap. It would be a lot easier just to brew for that tap and not worry about it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So that's probably coming down the road. 
Yeah, I think we'll probably add four more fermenters here pretty quick and, and make my life a little easier. Oh, well, that's good. So you went from uh, filling up your driveway to filling up the tap room. Yep. And like I say, with the, both my wife and I still running two other companies, this is a, a, we like to say this is a hobby out of control. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. Now, do you have some of those uh, same neighbors coming down to your uh, tap room now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're all in our mug clubs, and, and uh, so they've got their own mugs up on the wall, and and uh, they wish they didn't have to drive down. I mean, the good old days of walking across the yard and yeah, of course. dragging a chair with you are gone, but yeah, they're still coming down. Nice. So have you uh, entered or plan on entering any competitions? Uh, we actually are this March Washington Beer Association having a, a brewing competition uh, I think we have to have our uh, application in by the end of the month. And so we're uh, going to submit, uh, I think we've picked six different ones that we're going to go ahead and submit and just, uh, you know, winning would be nice, but what I'm really more interested in is just the feedback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just to hear how close you are to, to style, right? Yeah, and, you know, get everybody's input from, you know, supposedly people who have the palate for it to, mm-hmm. You know, if there's something that we could improve, we're always looking to, you know, improve as long as we don't wander too far away from what our customers like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, ultimately, that's the final judge. If your customer comes in day after day and drinks beer, I think you're pretty much a success. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, does this leave you any time to uh, attend any of the festivals? Yes. We try and go to, I would say on average, we go to... Well, pretty much every one we can get to. We just finished up three different um, events, and we've got uh, three more scheduled right now. Uh, we're actually doing a collaboration beer with Steam Plant downtown for oh, nice. the Craft Brewers Week here in Spokane, uh, starting, I think it's May 11th or 13th, somewhere right in there. Nice. So, yeah. so so a bunch of the breweries got together to collaborate beer. So two businesses plus your hobby, and you still have time to do all these other things. So you guys are pretty busy. Uh, we do. Sleep's overrated. Yeah. <laughs> I bet it is. So do you, if, um, let's see, I guess if you were able to keep the, the tap room um taps going with extra fermenters and stuff would you look at uh would you ever look at bottling or canning or anything like that oh we did we've talked about bottling and being able to sell here we did sell we sell growlers and and we did sell pigs but the uh the individual who was uh, manufacturing all the pigs i guess has decided to shut down his business so unless somebody picks it up and buys it uh we'll probably have to not distribute and sell pigs anymore but uh, at that point, we'll probably look at, at uh, doing some bottling and just doing the bombers out of the cooler here. Okay. All right. So uh, one last thing. Any Have you come across uh, any major problem or obstacle, whether it was when you did your build-out or anything other than um, maybe the uh, lack of uh, fermenters to keep up with your uh, demand? That was the big one, uh, and we didn't realize how much the food would have an impact. So, yeah, we did have to pick up some more fermenters and another oven uh, within a month or two of actually opening in order to keep up with the demand. I mean, those are good problems to have, and mm-hmm. certainly uh, don't look back and regret it at all. But uh, uh, other than that, it's uh, it's gone pretty smoothly and pretty much along the way we kind of hoped it would. It helps that you're both business people, so you have that mind already going for you. It does a lot. Yeah, yeah. having run businesses before, you're a lot, you know, not a lot of things throw you for a loop. You're pretty pretty quick to be able to react and make some some uh, quick decisions that, you know, drop right to your bottom line and, and benefit the business. So for us, it was really more a matter of just reacting to what we were faced with, but, but uh, you know, it didn't really cause any big problems for us it was more just okay we can you know we got to handle this and move on and it'll all turn around once we get to the end and we planned on at least a year before we could turn this around which we actually did it in a little bit less than a year but you know it pretty much followed our plan nice excellent 
Well, Jeff Bendio from English Center Brewing in Spokane Valley, thanks a lot for talking with us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for the call. All right. Thank you to Jeff for joining us today. We'll be right back after we take a little local music break from the Low Hums. You can check them out at lowhums.bandcamp.com. All right, thanks for that. Now, let's try another almost beer, since this is a cider. This is actually the first cider I'm going to be trying. It's a ginger cider by Schilling & Company, 6.5% ABV. It's in a can, and we're going to pour it out now. Located in Fremont in Seattle, Schilling Cider House has 32 rotating cider taps and an extensive selection of bottles and cans. They opened in September 2014. They pride themselves on crafting high-quality, complex ciders at attainable prices. Wow. You can definitely smell the ginger as soon as you pour that. And I've never had one of these ciders. This is actually pretty good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Taste the ginger, too. Ginger, without a doubt. As a short list description of their ginger cider, Schilling offers this. Ginger burst, spicy surge, complex balance, invigorating sips, and crisp finish. I kind of like a little Schilling story in the back. We started out as MBAs with corporate jobs in great cities. We used acronyms, wrote value propositions, worked with driven people, and wore ties. However, our dream was to bring great cider to the masses. So we crafted an exit strategy and took a deep dive. It's pretty good stuff. Very interesting. Yeah, you haven't tried a lot of cider, so. No, this is the first one. Is it your first? Yeah, I don't think I've ever tried any cider. So, interesting. I like it. Good. All right, and that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. Make sure that you tune in next week when we chat with Orlison Brewing. This show is produced and edited by me with engineering help from Michelle Rizzo. If you want to contact us, you can email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com 
or give us a call at 541-595-TALK. That's 541-595-8255. And if you leave us a message on the voicemail, we might put it late on the air. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay hopping, my friends.